Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. It's a podcast about uh, Gnosticism, if that's a thing. Um, but it's also a podcast about uh, Christian esotericism, mysticism, philosophy, the intersections of all these things, and also whatever I'm interested uh, in this week that I can tie in with these topics. We've got a great show for you with Dr. Shirley pa uh, Paulson with a, uh, a book that's really grabbed my attention, uh, a fantastic book, a moving book, an important book. You should all buy a copy. It's called uh, The Secret Revelation of John. On catching the light. Hello, Dr. Paulson. Oh, gosh, thank you. So great. Glad to see you and glad to be with you today. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and uh, I, I really love your work. Uh, you, I found you through, through your podcast, which is, um, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, folks at home, I'm not going to edit around this. So uh, before before we uh, started the show, uh, I mentioned that I've recently had a child and uh, my brain, it, it wasn't that great to begin with. And it's, uh, it's <laughs> it hasn't been helping, but it's called the Early Christian Text Podcast, The Bible and Beyond. Uh, it, it's a podcast that I've really been loving. If you like this one, then go check it out. If you don't like this podcast, well, this her podcast is much better. So, so go <laughs> check it out. And you can also find all her work at earlychristiantext.com. So uh, Dr. Paulson, we'll just kind of jump into it here. Okay. Um, uh, it, uh, I, when I do these shows, sometimes I, I, I do have a problem because we're trying to cram in a lot in 45 minutes to an okay. hour, right? Yeah. And, and these are pretty dense topics, dense subjects by time. But I, I think some of the audience out there is going to be familiar with at least some of the subject matter. They're going to have a curiosity about it. I'm going to link up, you know, free translations of the secret revelation of John, which you can right. read in one sitting. It'd be great if people could read your, your paraphrase, but th that's why they should buy the book. Yes, so, right, right. So I, I find this text fascinating. Um, I've read it, I, I don't know how many times. It's, it's literally dozens with an S. Every time I read it, I discover something new. Uh, I, I'm only reading it in English translations. English is the only language I almost know. But even, even in translation, <laughs> I, I get so much out of it every time. So how did you get interested in the secret revelation of John? And what drew you to write your book, Illuminating the Secret Revelation of John, Catching the Light? Well, you know, I don't, <clears throat> pardon me. I don't think you could have asked a harder question to start with because, um, um, well, I guess you're putting me kind of in a vulnerable place to talk about it, but I think also in talking about it candidly, it's why we'll explain why it's so important and relevant today. So I'm going to be candid with you, even though it might be a little hard for me, but I will. Um, I grew up as a Christian scientist and I always thought of myself as a Christian but I learned when I was an adult that there were Christians who thought I was not a Christian. And in fact, they were assuming that I was a heretic. So I learned from them what it was like to be a heretic and, and how painful that is because I thought all this time I was being a very good Christian. And so that's what I guess made me nervous about talking about this is that I know that some people just, just attack that way. But this also drove me to seminary I went to a mainstream Protestant seminary just to learn how to engage more in my Christian heritage. So I'd understand why people were so nervous around me and uh, where I was and wasn't a part of the conversation. While I was in seminary, I had a wonderful advisor who said, you talk like a heretic. I said, I don't want to. <laughs> and he said, you need to understand why you sound like one. And then then he introduced me to the secret revelation of John. He said, have you ever read this before? I said, no, I've never heard of it. He said, well, you sound like this. So I, he said, read this before you read any commentaries. So I read it and I, it was really hard to read. I mean, just very hard to read, but I ran across a few words that caught my attention and made me recognize, oh, that is my language which is very odd because if anybody knows Christian science, you know that it was founded in the 19th century by a woman who was grew up in a Christian tradition. She was a Calvinist and she'd never heard of Nag Hammadi. She'd never heard of the Gnostic text in it. They hadn't even been discovered yet by the time she died in 1910. So to sound like this ancient second century text when I'd never heard of it before was a weird experience. So it made me really dig in, even though it was complicated and kind of wild, I, I did get into it. But it, it, I got into it because of the whole controversy over, over heresy versus mainstream versus orthodoxy. And, and so I had to sort my way through all of that to be able to even read what it was saying. Once I got that far, then I felt like, 
This is extraordinary because this was written before there was ever such a thing as heresy, before there was ever such a thing as a, a doctrine to decide who was right and wrong. It was actually closer to Jesus' time than, than the um, you know, Nicene Council. <clears throat> so I thought, well, actually, this is our common Christian heritage because it's, it's that, that sort of genre of, of writing. So I got interested because for those reasons that, that it sounded like something I was familiar with, strangely familiar with, even though kind of different. So that's, then I had to keep going <laughs> from there. Well, thank you so much, and, and thanks for, for sharing your, your personal journey as well. Uh, and as you said, uh, the, even if it's uh, difficult for you, we, we really appreciate that. And, you know, it strikes me that uh, that if it, in Christian churches, in modern Christian, even in modern Christian churches, you know, every every Christian church considers at least some other group of Christians to be to be heretics. And uh, I would even say something like, I, I think people right away when I say something like that are thinking about conservative Catholics or evangelicals. But uh, I come from the mainline tradition, the mainline social justice uh, uh, tradition originally. Um, it's, it's a tradition that I, I still love and am close to in, in many ways even though I've sort of converted over to uh, uh, to this uh, esoteric uh, tradition that, that I love so much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of discourse in in the, the more liberal churches that, that, that say they don't use the words heretic or, or heresy, but they talk about other Christians as being like, well, they're misunderstanding the Bible, they're not getting it. It, it is the same language, right? It's, it's yeah. calling them heretics without, without uh, heresy. So yeah. it, it's, it unfortunately seems to be something that's that's wedged very deeply into Christianity and probably has been for a long time. But as you said, this this text gets us well before that. Um, yeah. So I yeah. think that's that's something that's really fascinating and a really important point. It, it actually leads right into our, our next question, which is, can you tell us about the time The Secret John okay. was written in, the context? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's important because you can't really understand what the book is talking about with understanding its context. So I'll make that kind of brief so we can get into the subject. But yeah, it was... Um, Probably, the scholars think it was written probably in the late 100s or what we call the second century, um, even probably around the time some of the later books of the Bible were written. So it was in that big mix of a lot of writing that was going on at that time. Um, I think people think that um, the Bible was written the day after Jesus was gone and it descended from heaven all in one wrapped up book, but it didn't happen that way. There were just a lot of books and a lot of writing and innovation that happened in the second century. And I think the reason for that is that this was a time where the Romans were still very much oppressing everybody, not just Jews. But um, so the Jews were feeling particularly per persecuted. They were a small nation and the Romans uh, just were attacking. And so there was a lot of searching for help. And I, I think that people turned to Jesus for help. Mm -hmm. And that that's why uh, a lot of the writing at that time was what basically what would Jesus do? <laughs> you know, How does he help us now when he's been gone over a hundred years? And so it's important to sort of know that context. So I, I think that that's important. Also the fact that it was written probably in Alexandria, nobody knows these things for sure, but it's likely it was in Alexandria because by this time, you know, the, the, the temple, the Jewish temple had been totally destroyed in the year 70 by Rome. So thousands of Jews had fled Jerusalem and there were more Jews living in Alexandria than even in Jerusalem at this time. So Alexandria was not only um, a, a place where lots of Jews were living and Jesus' followers were living, but also it was a, a, a center for thinking. The great library was there. where So philosophers and scholars of all types came to Alexandria. So there, um, people were drawn there to think and talk and ask and teach. So it's not surprising that a lot of thinking was happening there. That's why it's probably likely that this writer of this text was in that milieu in Alexandria. So those are the main things that it's in Alexandria. There was a lot of Greek philosophy, a lot of um, um, even Egyptian thinkers and um, Jewish thinkers and Jesus followers were all kind of mixed together there. 
And so you, you sort of recreate the, the context in your book. And, you know, this is a time where there's a, a bunch of uh, philosophical schools, a, a bunch of uh, different religions that are mingling, they're talking to each other, and there's teachers out there gathering yeah. students. Yeah. So, so you, you talk about this book perhaps being written by a teacher. Can you tell us about the audience that, that, he, that he was writing for? Was it just these, these Jews that, uh, that are uh, in Alexandria? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, this book helps us to expand our view, our assumptions of what was going on then. Again, I think having had the Bible all in one package when I grew up anyway, um, it, it, this has opened my eyes to understanding more who was reading it, who, why it was written and all those things. So, um, yes, there were Jews there. Um, and there was a mix of Jewish people who didn't like Jesus and people who did like Jesus. And they didn't identify themselves as separate religions. They just sort of had preferences. So some of the Jews who liked Jesus were probably inclined to this particular author. But also, remember, Paul had already been around in the years 60, 70, whatever. And so there were a lot of um, non-Jews who were attracted to Jesus' teachings. So there were, you know, I, I don't like to use the word pagan because it sounds so... Um, um, you know, derogatory about them, but they were just people who were, didn't grow up in a Jewish faith tradition who were following these uh, ideas of Jesus. And then there were probably just other philosophers and thinkers. So it's a big mix of people. Probably um, most of them were speaking a common Greek language. So we have Greek culture just because it's a Greek language. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have Greek and Roman and Hebrew um, and Egyptian kind of all mixed together there. Yeah. And you can almost picture too, you know, uh, uh, regardless of, of the person's background, you know, say they're, they're a quote unquote, a Greek pagan, uh, yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, they're a Platonist. Well, they're walking by and, you know, their ear, they just catch the word <laughs> demiurge, you know, Sophia. And it's like, oh, is, is that guy talking about Plato? I heard something about emanations, like this, this middle plate. Well, they didn't call it middle Platonism then, but <laughs> I know this stuff and I, I could picture them sitting down to be like, okay, I want to hear, hear what they got to say here. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think this author did a, incredibly fabulous job of bringing all these things together into what still seems like a Christian message because it's about Jesus who is teaching an alternative kingdom kingdom to virtually everybody. And can you tell us a, a bit more about the mix of inspirations and, and you know why this isn't perhaps a a Christian text in, in the way that perhaps a modern person may think about it or somebody who doesn't know anything about Christianity, uh, you know, maybe a, an agnostic or someone raised secular who has really rigid ideas about what must be in a Christian book. You know, this, I, I think this is a great insightful question if I'm answering you the way I'm thinking you're asking anyway. Um, it, it, it seems to me that it gives a paints a picture of what was going on in the years between Jesus and Constantine in a way that helps us. We tend to not know much about that period of time. And we sort of start with Constantine and think that was the beginning of Christianity, as if there was nothing that happened in between. But there were hundreds of years in between that are important to us. And I think since Jesus was really, a, his whole life, his whole mission was about helping people deal with the violence of Rome and helping people to be healed of problems he was not sitting around theorizing about theology. He was really helping people. Well, then by the time Constantine came around and the whole um, idea of religion completely changed, it not only became the dominant power, but the purpose of religion changed because they no longer had to fight against Rome. They were Rome. <laughs> it was the Holy Roman Empire. And so they changed, I think, from a helper healer kind of concept to becoming gatekeepers. Mm. And so I think that this early time here um, is a very different kind of um, way of understanding religion, even though the, I don't think you can use the term religion the way we think of it now, because of, everything changed after Constantine. So this this kind of um, mix of inspiration was uh, natural. They, were, uh, they didn't have a central church. They didn't have a central dogma or doctrine. So people thought about things in different ways that related to their own localities and their, their maybe their local gods or their um, just whatever it was that was locally going on. It was all part of the mix. Yeah. 
And you mentioned, you know, living under Rome in the context of this this book being written. Uh, Jesus pointing to to a superior kingdom to any kingdom on earth. What what was the political situation of most people living under Roman domination, or you know, the people in Alexandria, or the people that this was written for, and the people reading it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, politically, it was help us with Rome. <laughs> it was it was all about surviving Rome because um, they were conquered people. I mean, they, um, Israel had been conquered, so they were um, living with without the freedom to be themselves. Of course, their temple had been destroyed. It, it was a, a, a fight for survival for them. So it's interesting to think when you realize that's what was going on before before Constantine took over, they were a conquered people who were living uh, with the hope that there was some way out of this. Some, of course, during Jesus' time, we know that they were struggling to find if he was going to save them from that domination, and he didn't. He got crucified by them instead. So then the political picture was, how do we envision another way of thinking, another way of living? And they were, they were continually rebelling and failing over and over again. Um, so it was, it was a constant um, effort to survive through Rome. Yeah. Could you tell us about the, uh, the so we, we've been talking about Jesus, but uh, we kind of have a shape-shifting savior in this text. And it even <laughs> opens with, with Jesus changing uh, before John's eyes. And <laughs> I understand that, you know, the identity of the savior kind of changes throughout the text, uh, sometimes from context to context. Can you, can you tell yeah. us about this, the shape-shifter savior? That's just such an amazing part of this book. It really surprised me when I got into this because I had only known Jesus as my savior. That's all I knew. And so uh, the, you're right. The, it begins with, it's called the secret revelation of John. So this is Jesus explaining things to John the disciple. But of course, it was written 100 years or so after they were both gone. So it's an imaginary story telling about how um, Jesus comes to John after the, the crucifixion. So it's a post resurrection story and uh, John is in despair uh, in the story as the story goes because his savior was gone he had no idea where to go next he is having a crisis of faith so Jesus appears to him in a vision and in that vision John is trying to clear his eyes and to see what's going on he sees um, a, a young man coming who looks kind of like a servant and then he's also looking like an old man and then he's also uh, looking like a child so he's right there while he's trying to grasp what's going on. He can't quite get a hold of it because it's not, not the person Jesus standing there in front of him. But it sounds like Jesus. And Jesus says, you know who I am. And he reminds him of all the ways that Jesus had been teaching him. So yes, this is Jesus' teachings. But he says, get over the form of my body. It's not going to be the same for you. So from the beginning, it's like that. In fact, let me just read a, a little passage there where he had described himself to John. He says, um, John, John, why do you have doubts and why are you afraid? It is I who am with you always. It is I who am the father. It is I who am the mother. It is I who am the son. So right away, he's telling him, I am that which is helping you. Don't identify me in a body anymore. That's not what, what's going to help you. Then, of course, it goes on, and there are other forms of Savior, particular feminine forms that, that seem to be there. We can get into those maybe later, but yes, it, the, the idea of Savior says, I'm going to save you according to what you need, not according to what my body is telling you. Mm -hmm. And how is God like a mind in this text? And perhaps <laughs> maybe like our minds, and what might it be saying about mind? Oh, mind is a, a key topic. I love the way you're picking out on the really important parts of this book. This is great. So we don't have a modern working definition, I think, of mind the way it's used then. So I'm glad you're bringing this up. I would say that mind is not a reaction to things like being conscious of something out there, like I see something in my mind is working or my mind tells me this or that or, or, or analyzes things. Mind is the God. So mind is, because that mind thinks, it thinks its own ideas. So I think the a key word to help us understand mind is the word reflection, because mind reflects or thinks. 
And in thinking, it creates its own image. And that's actually what creation is all about. So mind is the creator, which is very different from the orthodox theology I had learned, which is that there's a God who's a transcendent God, and then there's a creating God who create like a dead demiurge who would create material things. But this, this creator is the only mind, the only God, and therefore the only creator. So the God creator is the same thing. And this mind then, um, I love the way it says that uh, it, 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 um, it's the mind that knows and therefore it gazes, you might say that that's thinking and it's thinking produces the thought, which is us. So we are the creation who is, we are ideas. So mind doesn't create something unlike itself being finite and mortal and subject to all the problems of mortality because it's unlike that mind. So mind creates like itself. And that means that our, by reflection, we are the image and likeness of God. Um, something that I, that I really loved in this book uh, uh, is um, where well, actually I you know I, I actually had to put the book down and go whoa okay <laughs> and uh, and I definitely circled it I underlined it but it's about Sophia's quote unquote fall and in, in the notes that I sent you I, I put I did put fall in scare quotes for those who are watching and not listening I'm doing the scare quotes with my with my fingers but yeah. but it's often puzzled about there's a lot of debate about it and you know some actually say that that it's um that it's a another sexist take on the Eve story they're sort of spiritualizing the Eve story blaming women pushing it back further in creation which I think is a very silly idea because of how this text uh, treats Eve but yeah. um and, other view it as just a mystery some view it as a weakness in the text like a, a logical weakness but um you compared it to, to christ's kenosis the, the <laughs> emptying of, of christ uh that, that's talked about in, in paul can you can you explain this to us yeah i am so glad you brought up this question you are the first person who's read my book who's actually even commented on it hmm. so and i i have a feeling it's because it's such a surprise yes and so i when i Notice that myself, I was underlining and circling it too. I thought, do you realize what this is saying here? So let me just explain that a little bit. Okay, so yes, traditionally, the, um, in fact, I think there are other texts written around the same time who maybe probably emphasize Sophia in the way you just described it. And so they, they may assume that that's what's going on in this text too, but I don't think it is. I think this text is saying something different that's quite startling and helpful. So the basic story is that Sophia was originally, Sophia, we should remember, is uh, translated from the Greek word. Um, uh, it is the Greek word that is translated as wisdom. So if we think of wisdom as being one of the earliest components of God's original creation, then wisdom was right there with creation. Wisdom was part of the creation. And so wisdom, or Sophia now in this story, is said to have made a big mistake and went off and decided to have make a creation all by herself. And she ends up creating this monster named Yaldabaoth, or names like that, who, who ends up creating all the evils of the world. So therefore she is the one in charge of all the evil. And that's why, yes, this is like a sexist take on Eve, meaning that she's the cause of all the evil. But I don't think so. <laughs> and, and here's why I look at it differently. <clears throat> I think what's happening is that uh, when you think about the way people tell the story of Jesus and the way he helped people, Jesus was not just floating around the sky being uh, a savior of, of miracle workers. Jesus made himself known in the world in such a way that people could relate to him and say, oh, he's a human like me. He gets, he can even suffer and die just like me as a mortal. And so it's not too far of a stretch to think that the creator, the, the original goodness, could be made known to human experience and show you the way out. That's the reason that Jesus did it, was to show you the way out. So Sophia, I think, I mean, the word wisdom is not just an accident. It would be wisdom that would say, let me help you out of your problem. And I can do that by showing you, here's the mistake, here's the problem, and here's the way out. So what she did then was by creating this monster of a creation, she then says, okay, the way out of this is to start with repentance. 
And then frequently, Sophia will come along and say, look at this problem. You don't have to be a victim of this. Look at this problem. You don't have to stay there. So wisdom is always the one who's guiding us out of the problem, just the way Jesus had done by making himself appreciable to the human experience. You know, I I didn't really you know describe this book or really get into the book that you wrote, but it's it's really a wonderful book, right? It's uh <laughs> it's, it's really written for everybody. So if you're a person of faith of of any faith, I'd say, or uh, faith curious, you know, you're spiritual yeah. but not religious, you're agnostic, I think you'd get a lot out of it. If you have scholarly inclinations, I think you'd get a lot out of it because you know this is not. Uh, there's specialties in in, yeah. in in scholarship. So this might be material that, that a lot of people who may even know a lot about the New Testament won't know about. Um, and, you know, something that struck me too is, is something that's kind of popular right now. It's not the most popular thing in the world, but if we're going to be looking back to ancient philosophies that have resurfaced, uh, stoicism, there, there's even a kind of pop stoicism out there. There's popular yeah. books being written about it. There's conferences, there's uh, podcasts, <laughs> uh, what have you. And, and, you know, when I was reading this book, I was thinking, man i i'd love to give this to some modern stoics i, I think they'd get a lot out of it yeah so can, can you talk a bit a, a bit about that you know so some of the connections between uh you know how how the stoics sort of uh viewed the passions and how this book sort of tackles that yeah and thank you for bringing up the the book first let me mention that before i go on and talk about the, the stoics uh, the reason i wrote this book was that it is a complicated text in the first place yeah. And to me, it was so powerful, so important, so rich with important ideas. I really wanted to make it accessible to real people today. So my goal was to write it in a way that anybody could read it. And so scholars who, you're right, not all scholars really know this particular little area very well, but thinkers will find there's a lot of depth to it, but you don't have to be a scholar to get into it. That was my goal. And that's why I wrote a paraphrase of the whole text in in language that I think people could understand for today. The paraphrase is at the end of my book of it. So, and it's not a long book either. You can actually read it without <laughs> getting too stuck in scholaries. So thank you for that. I appreciate you mentioning that. All right, now stoicism is an important thing. And I'm, it's interesting that it would come back today. I'm just not surprised that people are, are rethinking what was going on back then in new ways because before Nicaea again, there was such a rich openness for being able to think broadly. You didn't have to think in a certain way in order to be right. That wasn't the goal. So um, it makes sense to that today when people are searching and looking and expanding beyond boundaries, it would make sense to go back and rethink about how those things apply to today. So, the, But in order to understand Stoicism, you do have to understand the passions because the passions were a key part of what made stoicism work then. So passions were um, the key to understanding the way evil works and the way suffering would happen. Everybody believed in passions, Romans and Greeks and Jews and non-Jews, everybody was afraid of passions. It was just sort of the, the known world. So a passion just simply meant that there were forces out there that could come and manipulate you and your passion would be your feelings about things, like you'd have um, anger or um, uh, fear or whatever. These kinds of passions, when they when you act them out or you feel a response to these passions, that's what can manipulate your body and make you sick mm. or make you suffer in some way. So the passions were ways that once you were governed by a passion, you were in trouble. And you needed a savior to help you get rid of the passions. You need something to help you get rid of a passion. So the... Um, in fact, there, this book, The Secret Revelation of John, has a major section all about these passions and what they do to you. You can look, at, look those up if you want to. But the main point right now about Stoicism is that that was one of the, like I would say, the couch philosophers of the day were Stoics. Everybody knew Stoicism. And it was a way of helping people to find the self-control where you would not be manipulated by a passion. So that was a major goal was to find the means for, for not reacting to a passion. If you were told that your, your child just died, you better not react. You better say, oh, I'm sorry to hear about that or something, but don't have any more passion than that because then you'll be controlled by, by sorrow or something like that, and then you'd be in trouble. So the, the stoicism wasn't just 
a stiff upper lip. It had more to do with self-control. Mm. And self-control, of course, is the very thing that happened to Jesus and his own passion on the cross. Yeah. And um, is where um, the martyrs came from, was to be able to, to go to the glory of God without getting upset. Of course, there was a lot of debate over, over whether that was the right way to do it or not. But Stoicism had a lot to do with the way people thought about pain and suffering. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mentioned a, a few times in our emails going back and forth that, that I'm really excited to get you on to, to talk about this book. And I'll, and I'll share some both, some both personal and show reasons why. Okay. Which is I, I've been reading a, a lot of what's uh, called death of God theology, uh, sometimes radical theology. And you can guess just by the name that it's not always the cheeriest of stuff. Right. And um, I also... Uh, um, I, I really want to, whatever Gnosticism is, you know, I, I said before the show, if there wasn't a Gnosticism then, you know, there is now. We, we have a tradition going back to at least the 1800s. But I've also been reading a lot of the, the kind of depressing existentialist takes of, and this is even before kind of the people were reading Nag Hammadi, right? And maybe mm -hmm. it was kind of a recreated or, or uh, a Gnosticism that never existed. But, you know, there, there's sort of these, these depressing downer 40s, 50s, 1960s, uh, Weimar Germany uh, uh, takes. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I have been having, you know, some of those, those takes on the show because I really want to present a wide range of thought, philosophies, and uh, thinkers, right? Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, the, the people out there watching and listening can, uh, can decide for themselves. Yeah, uh, you great. folks, I, I don't know. You tell me. You, you <laughs> figure it out. So that that's why, you know, personally, uh, you know, uh, reading this book uh, really, really brought a lot of uh, light to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think it's a counterbalance to, to some of the more uh, downer programming we've been mm -hmm. doing, which, mm -hmm. which gets into the three gems of Secret John. Uh, <laughs> Can you can you tell us about these these three gems and maybe a bit about how Secret John teaches them to us? And again, I know this is a huge question. This entails yeah. you reading your book to us, but, yeah, right. um, but if you can do your best, <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Well, you're right. It is a, an upbeat kind of book, and I, the reason is that I think Jesus' whole message was to try to help people get over their agony. So his message is a hopeful one. It's a helpful one. Um, so now the secret revelation of John does not use the word gem. That's my word. Um, but I, I, I think of them as incredible, amazing ideas that I just call gems. And I think, and the book is written in three basic parts. Again, it's not delineated. Say here's part one, here's part two, and here's part three. But in general, the first part of the book is about the goodness of God. The second part of the book is about how do you describe evil, where it comes from. And the third part of the book is then how do you get saved from it? So those are the three parts of the book. Each one is a major gem in my mind. And the first gem, again, I'm just really summarizing this, is that the the idea of, of God is a, uh, all good and all powerful. Now, I know, having learned this in seminary and in my PhD work, that those two concepts just don't go together well. That theosophy would say, you can't have an all good God and all powerful God. How do you explain the Holocaust that just blows it out of the water? Well, I think this person who's writing in the second century was not naive because he's talking about Jesus, Jesus crucifixion. And how do you explain evil in the world? That was like the evil of the world of the day. But he still stands by the idea that God is all good and all powerful. And that's not to say that the powers used to dominate you it means you are empowered by this God. So this good God empowers you to be free from the domination of whatever source it might come from. So it's all about, that's the first gem is that God remains good and is not weak um, and is not fickle, but absolutely good. And therefore you can rely on it. The second gem, again, all three of these are complex actually, but the second gem is basically explaining the Sophia story we just talked about, that how does evil come? Well, it came from this wisdom creature who, who created evil so that we could, we're all suffering. But I think people miss the point about the key idea of what's going on with that particular for expression of evil, because what Sophia is doing is exposing the fact that through her wisdom, through, that evil doesn't have any inherent power of its own that Sophia is from coming from the realm of goodness was not able to endow 
that offspring with its own power, but rather it becomes a great big monstrous counterfeit spirit. And that's the word that's used in the text as a counterfeit spirit. That everything it tries to do is to mock the real God and try to be as powerful and as, you know, have all the glory of that God, but it can never do it because it's a counterfeit. So that's where the, the power comes from, is to recognize that no matter how much you may suffer and feel under the, the um, oppression of this evil, it's still a counterfeit and you have authority over it. So the, the story of evil is exposing all of its shenanigans and how it can hurt you and harm and kill you if you let it, but you have power over it if you understand that it does not have it power to hurt you. So that's the second gem, which I think is a gem because it, it gives you an understanding and a capacity to deal with being harmed like that. Then the third gem is the amazing idea that healing and salvation are one and the same. And again, that goes back to the pre-Constantine concept because um, before before the before Augustine, yeah, um, the idea of salvation was not about overcoming sins later. There was no such thing as original sin yet. So the word salvation in Greek is soteria, and that word actually means both healing and saving the same word. We bifurcated that word so that healing then later became a miracle, and salvation had to do with getting um, forgiveness of sins after you're dead. So they had nothing to do with each other later. But originally, they were the same word, soteria. So, and it means being helped from a tragedy or being saved from a problem. So it means being healed and it means being saved now instead of just after death or in a miraculous way. It's a practical, meaningful way of being helped. Yeah. And so the, the point is that the Savior comes to save you here and now instead of waiting till you're dead to figure out your problems. Yeah. And that's a gem. Yeah, and, the, and you kind of talk about, you know, you spend a lot of time on healing in the book because it's it's yeah. the main message of, of yeah. Secret John. But it, it is, to, to emphasize your point, it, it's a very holistic healing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just the body, it's not just the mind, it's not just the emotions, it's, it's, it's everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, to point out, with you, this is, you know, the the text calls these these figures savior, right? Both Jesus and some of these these other uh, figures. So that yeah. the, they yeah. mean both the, the healer and the one who who saves, right? Yes, so, right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and before death, that's the key part. Is that it's not just waiting for you to die and then saving you. It's yeah. it's when it's practically and it's practical and useful. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, here. Here and now. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so mind slash body, spirit slash ma uh, matter, and, and other dualisms, it's, they're commonly ascribed to this text. Oh. But uh, in your book, you write, this battle is not fought between the infinite spirit and the human and the human body, but between the spirit of light and the counterfeit spirit. Can you elaborate on this and maybe clear up some of these uh, misunderstandings, perhaps, yeah. about dualism and, and uh, secret revelation of John? Again, I, I, you're fabulous with these questions. I, I have to say, you you read this with depth because you're getting at the, the key concepts that make this thing work, I think. So thank you for this question. I, I think that the assumption of dualism is probably one of the biggest blinders for understanding this text. Um, people assume that we're talking, if every time you talk about spirit, there must be dualism because there must be spirit and matter because we obviously live in a material world and here's spirit, so there's dualism going on. But this text does not go there. It, it tells you that there's one mind, one creator, it's all good, and that all these evils are a counterfeit fraud. So there's no dualism going on. There's a reality of good and there's an unreality. And I don't want to dismiss, or how do I say that? I don't want to belittle the experience of evil by saying it's not there, but I'm saying, there's another way to look at it and you don't need to be a victim. So the whole point of this story, what gives you authority to do something or to act on this is the fact that you can find a way through the fraudulent picture of the things harming you. That it doesn't have authority. It doesn't have uh, capacity and power. So the, the, the battle is between the infinite spirit and the counterfeit spirit. 
Um, oh, I did. I, I again before the show. I, I love I love lifting up the curtain so the audience can peek behind of the okay. the fat the fascinating uh, day to day talk. But uh, but I was mentioning I, I have to do the Patreon uh, before the end of the show. We're almost yeah. at the end of the show, okay. uh, so I forgot to do it. So here it is, folks. Uh, you can help us keep doing this show by going to patreoncom slash gnostic, uh, kick in for as little as a dollar uh, per piece of media per month. I, I think we're going to change that to some subscription model, but you can do as, as low as a dollar. Uh, give us whatever you can. And if you can't give us anything, we understand. Just tell people about the show, share it. Uh, unfortunately, the way that the world works is you have to uh, like, subscribe, leave good comments. That kind of lifts up the show uh, by the algorithm uh, and uh, gets it gets it out to more people. Uh, and, um, you know, mouth to ear is still powerful. You know, the copy and uh, the link to this show that you're listening to right now, send it to someone who, who will love it as much as you. And you can do uh, paypal.me slash Gnostic for one-time donations. Um, Okay, so uh, the, the the big question to tie everything up is, does this text matter for the 21st century and why? <laughs> I love the way you're talking about the, the Patreon support and in this world now, because you are so right that we do live by patrons and we do live by practical support. So I'm supporting your practical support. That sounds great to me. <laughs> and so, yes, I think this text is incredibly relevant today. That's why I was willing to be kind of vulnerable about this up, up at the beginning of the show, um, because I think that it, it, it helps to really think through where are we today in our, um, in our, especially our understanding of victimization. There's so much, um, I, there's still so much hatred and agony and harmful things going on in the world. And, and I think that there's been a, a long time assumption that we're just victims of everybody. Everybody's a victim of somebody and we're stuck that way. But this text is saying, you can't, you can't live like that. And there's a way to go forward. So it's all about moving forward. And, and really, I, I think that um, what this book does is to say, rethink the premises that you're living with. Rethink the um, assumptions that you're making. If you can grasp the idea that there's a, a force for good in your life and that whatever forces of evil are happening are not equal forces, they're not as legitimate as the good forces, then there's a way to have a response to these things with, with authority and your own dominion. I think it gives us the space to think what would it really mean if we lived in an egalitarian world? This this text requires it because it says that if God mind made all of us in the image of God, then there's no superiority anywhere. We may be un uh, unique and different. We are, but we're we're not um, living in a hierarchy anymore. That this text is pre hierarchical thinking. So, it, but the other thing it does is it. I think it'll help us grasp the the new concepts, for example, of quantum physics. Now, I know quantum physics is not really new anymore, but most of us don't get it. <laughs> and I, I think that we've been living um, so with such an entrenched belief in Newtonian physics, it's hard to yield to the idea of quantum physics. Now, I'm not a phys physicist, but I know enough about quantum physics to recognize where the mental battle is because basically the assumption in quantum physics is that there's something going on beyond measurable Newtonian physics. You can't measure this because there's some kind of mental action that you can't measure with um, finite things. That is very important because somewhere along the line, we've got to figure out where consciousness is working. And that's what this text is about. It's all, all about consciousness and uh, where it comes from, what you do about it, and how it gives you dominion. So I think that, uh, again, this, this text was written at a time where there was um, a need as well as freedom to think innovatively. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think that's a that's a great wrap up. But uh, before we go, you know, we mentioned your podcast and your website, uh, Early Christian Texts. But tell us about them again, because your website is there's a lot going on there, right? So <laughs> yeah, tell, tell us what people can discover by going to Early Christian. Oh, Texts. thanks for oh. asking. Okay, sure. All right. Well, so the the website includes a monthly podcast, and the podcast is called Bible and Beyond because the name of the whole website is 
early Christian texts, colon, the Bible and beyond. So um, all of the um, activities we do are called Bible and beyond. So the podcast out there in the syndicated world is called Bible and Beyond Podcast. And then um, I write a monthly blog. Well, there's a blog called Bible and Beyond Blog. I write on it, and I also have some amazing scholars who write with me. Uh, we've had Hal Tosig and Brandon Scott, and now Aaron Vierncombe is joining us. And so, and we have some guest scholars who write on the blog. Um, and then I have a monthly textual study going on that's open to anybody on a Zoom. So you can listen to a, a kind of a scholarly introduction to a certain topic, and then anybody on the Zoom can ask questions and talk about it. So that goes on once a month. Um, and then I have um, some online courses. Those online courses are on the Gospel of Thomas. The three of them from the Nag Hammadi. There's the, uh, the Thought of Noria, Gospel of Thomas, and um, what was the third one? Ah, it escapes me at the moment. How could I do that? I don't know. But anyway, then I've also done a, a, a course on After Jesus Before Christianity. Um, and then also one on ancient healing and Christian texts. Yeah. So those are the, some of the online courses I have. Wonderful. And, and I will link that. And I'll find that third course because if it's on the Nag Hammadi text, I'm sure lots of people uh, watching and listening will, will want to check that out. And yeah. uh, and uh, after Christian, sorry, it's after Jesus before Christianity, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which, which is a, a book that you contributed to as well as a course that, you, uh, that you're teaching. Yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah, I contributed. Yeah. I thought of the third one. It's called The Letter of Peter to Philip. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. So, yeah, and that one's all about um, how uh, being, you know, getting over victimization also, so about violence. So, so those are the three from the Nakamai text. Oh, fantastic. Well, everybody, uh, check that out. You're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, buy the book. So, uh, <laughs> you're, it's, it, and as you said, it's like it, it's a relatively fast read, right? It's it, it's delightfully written. It's it's not um, uh, you don't dumb things down. Yeah. So it's um, it's approachable. It's uh, you can read it in a couple of sittings. Uh, you'll get a lot out of it. So uh, go buy the book. And uh, Dr. Great. Shirley Paulson, thanks so much. Oh, thanks so much. Great to talk to you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.